I know. I love it. I know. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. On this uh, lovely June 19th Sunday morning, a special welcome to all of you, uh, locals and people from far away, and those of us, those who are joining us online later. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 93. This is a psalm that speaks of God's sovereignty his everlasting sovereignty. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. We celebrate God's kingship in a personal relationship with Jesus, the Anointed One, who came to earth to establish God's kingdom, his sovereign and eternal kingdom. So let us stand and join April and Danielle as they lead us in our first song of praise, Fairest Lord Jesus. Welcome here, everyone. We're glad to have you. You can have a seat for a moment. Um, 
Welcome to the Whistler Community Church. I'm Steve. I'll be the MC. Uh, just wanted to read something which many of you may have already um, read this morning. It's the verse of the day on the on the Bible app, which I think is a is a good one. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. And I think it's just a good reminder on this Father's Day that um, though some of us have wonderful fathers, some of us may not, um, the Lord God is our uh, Heavenly Father who you know, has kindness and compassion and goes with us through life always and is always faithful. Um, why don't we take a minute just to uh, welcome and say hi to the people that are sitting around us and uh, yeah. How are you? I'm good. That's yeah, good? I am good. I'm yeah. intercepting you so you don't have to go too far yeah, from the I'm piano. <laughs> <laughs> no, good. Yeah, we uh, had a few FaceTime calls this morning. And, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so that was, that was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Now, the family up front there, you know yeah. them? Yes, Barbara and their, um, she comes to Thriving Mom. I might just do a, a comeback chord. <laughs> a comeback chord, right? Is Sam, is Sam here? Yeah. All right, everyone, if we could come yeah. back to our Good. seats. So Paul's going to queue up some announcements for us. All right. So just, yeah, a reminder that we do have potluck next Sunday. That's, that'll be after the service. Everybody welcome that's able to, to come. Please, uh, if you can, re remember to bring food. And also, um, if you can, please stay and help with the cleanup afterwards. Um, as they say, many hands make light work. Ah, yes. So, this is exciting. Uh, the Rempels, Leggetts, uh, Monica and Steve and Daniela have been in Germany for the last year. Um, they are going to be returning uh, in, the, in a week. And uh, this, is, this is exciting for all of us that, that love them and are looking forward to seeing them in person again. Um, if, you, if people could remember to pray for Monica as she travels because she is um, uh, dealing with a, uh, I can't even pronounce what it is, but, it's, but she's got an illness that is making it uh, very uncomfortable for her to be in basically any position other than lying down. So, um, yeah, if you can pray that she's able to travel and uh, able to travel with some comfort, please. Just a reminder that um, your <coughs> generosity is what makes the church um, be able to open up our doors on Sunday. Uh, there's opportunities to give to different things and 
in the church. Um, uh, Karen's going to talk about the uh, refugee sponsorship program that we're doing, but you can also donate to the church general fund and, and the building fund. There's a giving station just uh, outside the door here. So thank you for giving cheerfully. Uh, Young Life Gravel Fondo. Uh, Anne, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, I'm the Team Whistler captain, and uh, Janichi and his daughter have joined me. We're going to be riding uh, from Whistler to Squamish on September the 17th. It's a downhill ride, and it's a gravel ride. It's not technical, so it's like a nice cross-country flowy ride. Um, I just want to encourage anybody that wants to consider joining the team. It's a fundraising opportunity for Young Life, and... Um, it's, uh, there's a wrap-up party after. It's fully supported. There's aid stations and water stations and people that know how to fix flat tires if you run into anything like that. So it's really just a fun ride, and it's a great opportunity to ride an amazing trail uh, from Squamish to Whistler. So if you'd like to join uh, me, we're, I'm doing a training ride next Saturday at 11 o'clock. If anybody wants to join, just from meeting at Function, where the start of the Sea to, to Sky Trail is. We're just going to go for an easy ride just to check out the first flowy part of the trail. So um, you can message me or get a hold of me. Um, I'd love to have somebody ride with me on that. And also, I do want to also just wish Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And we have chocolates for the dads today. So at the end of the service, uh, all the dads, uh, whether your kids are here or not, please come up and uh, treat yourself to a chocolate. Thanks. <laughs> Sam? Oh, Karen, I guess you're coming up to say something about the refugee sponsorship program. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I've got everything written down so I don't forget anything, so bear with me as I read. Uh, first, actually, I wanted to start with Philippians 2, which says, Unity through humility. Therefore, if there is any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So first and foremost, I wanted to um, just ask the people who are here today that are part of the Refugee Sponsorship uh, Committee to stand up please. I know you're here and I see you, so you can't get away with trying. Excellent. Great. Okay. So everybody stay standing, please. <laughs> I'm going to make you guys uncomfortable. Uh, these are the people that are helping with this refugee sponsorship, okay? And we need more people. We need support. Uh, this is a really big, big endeavor. So if you have questions or if there's anything on your heart, these are the people to reach out to. Please remember their faces, okay? And thank you to each one of you. Uh, another thing that I wanted to say quickly is that memo that said give cheerfully. I, I do agree, but I also have learned in my life to give uncomfortably. So I want to challenge you guys, okay? Uh, it is, it, it, I don't want to say it's easy to give cheerfully. It's not easy to give uncomfortably. <coughs> and I'm calling out on you guys to give uncomfortably. This family, we have a budget. And Paul's going to put it up. This is our goal. I know it's a big number. But this has been ongoing since 2019, correct me if I'm wrong. And we did have a two-year COVID break, a year and a half. The whole world just stopped, right? So next slide, please. This was our balance at the end of last year. All things considered, that's actually amazing. People were very <laughs> generous. We had a yard sale. Uh, next slide. This is the current rummage sale we just had a couple of weeks ago. It went far beyond what we expected. We were thinking maybe $3,000. We made 5600 So we're super thankful for that number. Uh, went above and beyond. Uh, recent donations on top of that, $26,000. Got another $5,700 plus the $5,600 from the rummage sale. Grand total, please. All right. So we're almost halfway there. Actually, we're beyond halfway there. Um, and so the remaining amount, this is our goal, $70,000. I know it's a big number, but we have an even bigger God, okay? And so I'm, I'm calling on you guys to please just dig deep um, and to donate. I do want to just read something that I wrote out because it's 
been a reminder for myself as well when we look at numbers, when we look at the housing crisis, when we look at all of these things, we get overwhelmed. Um, and so I just wrote out a little prayer. My prayer is that people would hear God's instruction. The money is already there. In God's kingdom, there's no need for doubt or fear, for God is sovereign over all. Don't forget who we came here to worship, praise, and learn about. The one who created the heavens and the earth. The one whom we can't wrap our minds around. Take the thoughts and analytical mind away from the number and focus on the provider. Praise God for providing. Ask him to reveal more and more of himself to you. And there's lyrics to this song that I love right now, and it says, Faith makes a fool of what makes sense, but grace found my heart where logic ends. And I just want to finish with a quote from uh, Samuel Rutherford. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Samuel Rutherford. He was a pastor way, 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 way back in the day. I verily, uh, pardon the English, it's that old English. I verily judge we know not how much may be had in this life. There is yet something beyond all we see that seeking would light upon. So seek God, ask him, what do you want my donation amount to be? Uh, give uncomfortably, please. And then I'm just going to quickly introduce Leah. So Leah, thank you, Abraham, who constructed this for us. He didn't even hesitate. He was like, sure, I'll do it. Um, so Leah is our fundraising girl, and the, the, the kids have helped us. They have, yep, decided that it's a girl. Yeah, decided, they had a vote. They decided it was a girl. They named her, and her name is Leah. She's not finished, though. We're going to complete her. There's more to be done. And we're going to start, actually, this month, I believe. Hopefully, by the beginning of July, she'll be complete and ready to go. But every month, we're going to switch up the themes. So we're going to start with skiers versus snowboarders. You know, I think it's pretty cool because it's Whistler. Skiers versus snowboarders. So I'll show you how it works. Does anybody have some money? <laughs> Cash, please. <laughs> coins, coins. I'll take bills. Thank you, Pauline. Oh, are you a skier or a snowboarder? If you could choose, if you could choose, would you be a skier or a snowboarder? Okay, okay. Here we go. Oh, okay. So just to let you guys know right now, uh, she's not complete. I do have to put a couple of nails in here so she doesn't tip all the way. So, so far right now, the skiers are winning, okay? So we're going to place this out front every Sunday, and we're going to have you guys just donate. Are you a skier or are you a snowboarder? And this means that you're winning. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Thank you. So we don't have any updates on arrival. However, they have called a mandatory two-hour meeting this Tuesday. I believe that's probably the next step before arrival. So things are moving along. We are, or we're anticipating that they'll be here this year. But there, and this has been a real process for us of faith because we're having to have things prepared before we even know when they're coming, which one is, because the family is separated. We don't know if they're coming together. We don't know if it's the father or the children and the mother. Um, so we've just had to kind of prepare things and just trust God to, you know, show us the way. So that's where we're at right now with arrival. Yeah, if we could I just give uh, maybe a quick round of thanks for Karen and Lori and everyone else that's uh, been helping out with this and giving. Thanks. Um, yeah, good. So uh, as you may know, uh, the Pazook family, John, Stephanie, and, and kids have been on sabbatical for almost three months now. It's a three-month sabbatical, and so they will be uh, returning uh, very shortly. I think um, John will probably be back on the off in the office on the uh, 27th or 28th, somewhere in there, so just uh, around the, the end of the last week of June. And uh, we'll be preaching for the first time on uh, July the 3rd, Sunday. I think I got that right. So, yeah, we're excited about having them back, and uh, hopefully we can all... Uh, welcome them back graciously when they when they do arrive. Um, 
Anything else on the docket there, Paul? No, not missing anything. Okay, that's good. Uh, I will open us up with a brief prayer, and then uh, we will do some more worship. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this uh, wonderful day that you have made today. We thank you that we're able to come here and worship together. Lord, I pray that, uh, yeah, you would just open up our hearts to worship in, um, in truth and in spirit, uh, full of gratitude and, and faith in what you have done and what you have in store for us in, in your uh, future. Thank you, Lord. Amen. begin by saying the beginning words of Psalm 91. Uh, we are going to be singing this um, next. My dwelling place is God most high, my refuge and my fortress. When plague and pestilence draw nigh, I'm hidden in his presence. When terrors fall and arrows fly, his shield will be my safety. When stones across my pathway lie, on angels' wings, I'm carried. <clears throat> Yes. 
secure in love's pure light beneath my master's favor he freed me from the foulest snare when sin and shame had bound me deceived i'd made my refuge there Till fearless he came for me. Wonderful, powerful, my hope and my defender, mighty God, Emmanuel, my dwelling place heart he'll keep forever for I am his and he is mine I'll never seek another I know the name on whom I call he promises to answer with life he satisfies my soul and crowns me with his pleasure. David is speaking on Daniel, uh, if you're not, and uh, we thought uh, the uh, theme of Sunday School Kids will be um, leaving, and we thought we would sing Dare to be Daniel, um, which I'm hoping many of you will know. <laughs> Please uh, join me in prayer this morning for our congregational prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day that you have made. You speak things into existence and you sustain them by your power. Thank you for your works that are on display all around us. We praise you for your goodness. In Isaiah 55, you give an invitation to eat and to drink without price. And we recognize that we are the recipients of such gifts. 
We come as poor and needy, and you clothe us, you feed us, and you quench our thirst, our ultimate thirst. Help us to behold you as you are and to renew in us the joy of your salvation. May we increasingly be a people marked by humility, by grace, generosity, and love for you and others. Spare us from a love for the things of the world and help us to live for that which is eternal and assured. We pray for Steve and Michelle's son, Joshua, as he struggles with serious depression. Would you provide the right practitioners to deal with the medical and circumstantial issues in his life? Would you open his heart to you and to the gospel that he would know you? Give strength to Steve and Michelle. We pray for the Pazook family and especially for their baby who is in breach. Lord, if it is your will, would you turn he or she around for a smooth birth and would you protect both the baby and Steph from complications? We pray for Paul and Karen's friend, Nigel, who's in the hospital right now with blood clotting in his stomach, amongst other issues. Lord, please heal him and reveal to him that you are with him and that you care for him. We pray for those who are lonely, that they would find deep relationship with you. We pray for those who are anxious, that your peace that surpasses understanding would come over them. We thank you for all the fathers in our church and how they give us an imperfect glimpse of you. Thank you that you are our true, eternal, and our heavenly Father. Amen. Can I ask uh, Grace and the Sunday School kids to come up, please? Um, Karen, I just wanted to add a little bit to um, sharing about the refugee family. The $70,000 that we are looking at as a budget is our commitment to supporting a family of five for one year. So um, we try to build in um, as many contingencies, going to school, rental, um, housing, etc., transportation, now that the buses are back. Um, so all of, all of those things are, are part of that um, those monies that we are talking about. And just like God is asking us to look after um, a family that's coming, um, today's story is a family redeemer story and somebody who traveled to a foreign land where they um, didn't grow up and didn't know anybody, and we're going to see how God provides care for that person as well. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your care for each of us. We pray especially that you would um, help the children today understand um, how you care for them, how you have plans for them um, today and tomorrow, and how you would have them serve you with their family, with their friends, with their schoolmates, um, with the people that they meet. We just pray all of this in your name. Amen. Wow, so quiet. All right, and Pastor David, take it away. Thanks, Steve. God, we thank you for your word that is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. We ask... Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate your word to us this morning, that we would understand it and embrace it by faith with great joy. And may this glorify you and give us great pleasure to walk with you. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you imagine 
living in a foreign land for most of your life? Where people are not accepting of your faith? In fact, at times, they are openly hostile to it. Can you imagine working within the government of such a country? Consider how difficult it would be to remain true to your convictions in such a setting, where there is constant pressure to assimilate with the surrounding culture. Well, in the person of Daniel, who was taken captive from Jerusalem at the age of 15 or 16 by the conquering Babylonians in 605 BC, we find such a person. He spent the rest of his life as an exile in Babylon, where he served under four different kings over a period of 66 years. This first required a demanding three-year training program, where he and his three friends were forced to adopt new names, a new language, and Babylonian customs before they could serve in the royal court. Despite serving in a pagan setting, throughout this entire time, Daniel remained faithful to Yahweh. The rulers Daniel served may have changed his name, his language, and his customs, but they were never able to change Daniel's primary heart allegiance, which was to God. Daniel knew to his core, despite living in exile, thousands of miles away from his home, that God was sovereign. No matter how bad circumstances got, Daniel understood that Yahweh was ultimately in control. The Lord was always working out his sovereign plan, both for individuals as well as as for nations of the world. Daniel's faith and trust in God was so unflinching that he was a particularly effective witness to the rulers and administration of the Babylonian and later Persian court, who knew nothing about the true living God, the God of Daniel. How did Daniel remain faithful under such pressure, in such hostile circumstances. Today, we are going to look at three narratives involving Daniel that I hope give you some insight as to how he could remain so secure in God's sovereignty. So let's begin by looking at Daniel's first encounter with interpreting a dream of the king early in his career of serving in the royal court. We find this in Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 to 24. Looking first at verses 1 to 16. One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such, a, had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, Long live the king! Tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. But the king said to the astrologers, I am serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. But if you tell me what I dreamed and what the dream means, I will give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Just tell me the dream and what it means. They said again, Please, your majesty, tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. The king replied, I know what you are doing. You're stalling for time. Because you know I am serious when I say... If you don't tell me the dream, you are doomed. So you have conspired to tell me lies, hoping I will change my mind. But tell me the dream, 
and then I'll know that you can tell me what it means. The astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. And no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream. And they do not live here among people. The king was furious when he heard this. And he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. He asked Arioch, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Arioch told him all that had happened. Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. Okay, so let's pause for a moment. What was with the Babylonians and the emphasis they put on dreams? Well, they highly prized dream interpretation because they believed that their gods spoke to them through their dreams. Furthermore, one old Babylonian proverb said, if a man cannot remember the dream he saw, his personal God is angry with him. So knowing this explains why King Nebuchadnezzar was so troubled. He desperately wanted to know what the dream meant. And he was prepared to kill all the wise men when they could not discern and interpret his dream, including Daniel. So, what does Daniel do? Let's return to the story and look at verses 17 through 24. Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. He said, Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events and removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things, and knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You have told me what we asked of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. Then Daniel went in to see Arioch, whom the king had ordered to execute the wise men of Babylon. Daniel said to him, Don't kill the wise men. Take me to the king, and I will tell him the meaning of his dream. So, yes, you got it. Daniel goes home, and he shares the issue with his three friends, who are also in Babylon as exiles from Jerusalem. We know them better, of course, from their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They lift up the matter together in prayer, specifically asking for God's revelation and for Daniel's life to be spared. It's actually Daniel and his three friends. Daniel's prayer of praise, which we read, we just finished reading, is very remarkable. Why? Well, first, because before rushing to the king to share his interpretation, what does Daniel do? He pauses to praise God for his revelation of the dream. This not only reveals a spirit of exuberant gratitude, but also a spirit of humility. 
Second, his prayer is remarkable because he acknowledges God as the source of all wisdom and power. Daniel understands that his insight and understanding are absolutely dependent on God. Third, Daniel's prayer is exceptional because he confidently expresses that God is in control of rulers and world events, despite him having to live in an enemy nation that has just destroyed God's temple in Jerusalem. So if you've got a really good memory or you know your Bible history, Daniel's already been here 19 years. Nebuchadnezzar took him when he was pretty young in 605 B.C., and Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed in 586. So they've been going through a hard time. 19 years have already passed. You see, Daniel knows that God governs the world according to his divine purposes. And fourth, Daniel thanks God for his answer to their prayer request to reveal the king's dream and its meaning. So let's move now to narrative two. But go back to the beginning of Daniel's prayer, which we just read. Daniel begins by saying, Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events, and he removes kings and sets up other kings. So here, Daniel is confidently declaring God's sovereignty, isn't he? In fact, all the stories we find within the book of Daniel reveal God's wisdom and power right from the get-go. God's sovereignty is powerfully illustrated in the account of Daniel in the lion's den, which is told in Daniel chapter 6. Here's a synopsis of this well-known story. Daniel is a prophet of the true and living God to the exiled Jews in Babylon. He has already served faithfully in the royal court of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar and then King Belshazzar for a time of over 60 years. So Daniel is now in his 80s. And he's serving under Darius the Mede. Daniel's reputation as a man of integrity is impeccable. Daniel 6 verse 4 says that in his handling of government affairs, he's always reliable, responsible, and completely trustworthy. King Darius is tricked by some of his advisors who are jealous of Daniel. He's tricked into making a decree that, will, that people should pray only to him for the next 30 days. Of course, this appeals to the king's vanity, and it results in Darius being treated like a god for the next month. Fully aware of the decree and its consequences, Daniel continues with his long-standing habit of praying to God three times a day on his knees, with the windows of his upstairs room open towards Jerusalem. And so, the evil administrators who convinced Darius to draft up this decree catch Daniel in the act of praying to God rather than to the king. The decree states that any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, other than King Darius, will be thrown to the lions. Also, once this decree is signed by the king, it cannot be revoked. So Daniel is arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king is deeply troubled, but cannot think of a way to save Daniel. That night before Daniel is thrown in with the lions, the king says to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve faithfully, rescue you. God indeed rescues Daniel 
sending an angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt him. As Daniel 6, verse 23 reports, not a scratch was found on him, for Daniel had trusted in his God. I was reading that, um, the historical background of this story, and I understand that they used to actually starve these lions purposely. So they were pretty hungry when things were thrown in from the top. King Darius is overjoyed and orders Daniel to be lifted out of the lion's den early the next morning. The king has the men who conspired against Daniel thrown to the lions, along with their immediate families. Now that sounds pretty severe, but that was the thinking and the practice of the day. Then this pagan king sends out this extraordinary message to all his subjects. He's a pagan king. He says, I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Years before the reign of Darius, King Nebuchadnezzar also acknowledged that only God's kingdom is forever but not before God first humbled him to eating grass like a cow in order to show that Almighty God, not arrogant Nebuchadnezzar, was Lord of the nations. This story comprises chapter 4 of Daniel's personal account. So clearly here we see that God is not only sovereign over history, and nations, but also over his creation. And the power of man is nothing compared to his power. So let's look at another episode in Daniel's life, narrative three. We are looking at another prayer of Daniel's, one that comprises all of chapter nine. At least one theologian describes this as the theological centerpiece of the book. So first, a little context. Daniel has been reading Jeremiah 25, verses 11 and 12, which reads, This entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Then... After the 70 years of captivity are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins, says the Lord. I will make the country of the Babylonians a wasteland forever. In other words, Daniel knew that this 70-year period prophesied by Jeremiah was coming to an end. And so he turns to God And he pleads with him in prayer and fasting. His prayer is recorded in chapter 9, verses 4 through 19. And if you are following along on your own Bibles, um, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Daniel prays, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, You are in the right, but as you see, 
our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel, scattered near and far. Wherever you have driven us, because of our disloyalty to you. O Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now, the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down upon us because of our sin. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek the mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us a disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all these things, for we did not obey him. O Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. O oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. O oh, my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay, O my God, for your people and your city bear your name. Daniel is a man who knows how to pray. As he enters into prayer, he is fasting, wearing rough burlap, and sprinkles himself with ashes. He approaches with humility, and he is singularly focused on God. He begins his prayer with adoration, praising God for his steadfast love and power. He then confesses not only his sins, but the sins of the entire Jewish nation who find themselves in captivity. Despite the disaster that has befallen Jerusalem, he acknowledges that the Lord is justified in his judgment, brought down upon Israel's covenant unfaithfulness. God is doing exactly as he said through prophet after prophet, who warned Israel of the consequences of rejecting God prior to the complete destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Then he acknowledges and appeals to God's mercy and forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, let us learn from Daniel's example. His prayer is reverent. It's passionate. It's vulnerable. It's honest, and it's transparent. Do you and I pray to God, our Heavenly Father, in the same way? Do we pour out our heart to Him?
So what are today's takeaways from our look at the Old Testament character of Daniel? I have two points of application for today. Application number one. Even though Daniel was a foreigner who stood alone in the royal court in terms of his faith in God, he was highly respected. Listen to these words spoken by the queen mother of King Belshazzar. After the king saw a disembodied human hand writing incomprehensible words on the wall of his palace during a great feast and was greatly troubled. She says, this man Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. And of course, if you go to that story in chapter 5, Daniel does explain it. So Daniel was indeed gifted with knowledge and understanding. For this reason, some have called him the prophet of dreams. But he also intensely and regularly prayed to God for wisdom and insight, expecting God to answer. Friends, that ought to be our practice as well. Chris Tigreen says, we ought to pray in faith without doubting that God has the answers we need and that he is willing to share them with us if we will open ourselves to him. Without doubting and if we will open ourselves to him. Big if. James 1, verses 5 to 8, also communicates this clearly to us. James writes, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all, without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Double-minded is what James says in verse 8. The original Greek is the word dipsukos. And it literally means a person of two minds, two, two souls inside of them. I've also, uh, it's also described as being a spiritual schizophrenic. One believes, the other disbelieves. And the person is a walking civil war in which trust and distrust of God wage a continual battle against each other. So yes, like Daniel... Let us, be, let us be devoted to our sovereign and loving God in prayer, believing we shall receive what he knows is good and right for us. So one of Daniel's strengths certainly lay in his devotion to prayer. How about our prayer life? Unlike Daniel, our prayer life is probably not being interrupted by life-threatening challenges. But it may be pressured by our schedules. We must make prayer a daily priority because it is a key lifeline to God. It's a critical aspect to us keeping in step with the Spirit. Let's follow Daniel's example of lifting up prayer that comes from the heart. Prayers that are passionate, honest, and transparent. We need to do this as individuals. We need to do this with our partners. 
We need to do this in our small groups. We need to do this as a congregation. Absolute passion, honesty, and transparency. God sees all. He knows. Application number two. The theme that dominates the book of Daniel and that Daniel himself embodies by the way that he lives is God's sovereignty. God's supremacy and power permeates and supersedes every aspect of life. I encourage you to prayerfully contemplate Psalm 139 before the day is out and realize how unlimited God is in his power, in his presence, and his wisdom. Before we have even spoken a word, he knows it. He knows what we are thinking. In fact, from the stories of King Nebuchadnezzar and King Belshazzar, who failed to listen to Daniel, we learn that human pride and rebellion are self-destructive because they fail to acknowledge the sovereign and everlasting king of the universe. God is so sovereign over history, over those who seek to destroy his people and his creation. Our opening question was this. How did Daniel remain faithful under such pressure, in such hostile circumstances? My short answer, he did this by maintaining a crucial lifeline with God through prayer and by trusting completely in God's sovereignty. I'm sure his three friends were also another critical component to that success. Daniel's stories and apocalyptic visions tell us that no matter how impressive they may look at the moment, all earthly kingdoms are temporary. Look at history. That proves true. So don't despair because of world events. Ultimately, the Son of Man will usher in God's eternal kingdom, as Daniel declares in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, that's Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Amen? Amen? Let us close off this time in God's word and prayer. God, we praise you for your sovereignty is everlasting. As your creatures, your children, you give us the freedom to choose and to make decisions. And so we are and we will be answerable to you as creator, father, and judge. We rejoice in the fact that no one can stay your hand or thwart your plans. And because you are sovereign, the world ultimately stands firm and cannot be shaken. As the psalmist declares, your way, God, is perfect. All your promises prove true. You are a shield for all who look to you for protection. We confess that at times, God, your ways confound us. 
But then the prophet Isaiah reminds us that your thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither are your ways our ways. Our responsibility as your children is to seek you, to trust you, to obey you, and to cheerfully submit to your will. Because you are a wise, all-powerful, and loving Father, we thank you and praise you that whatever you ordain in your sovereignty will be ultimately for our benefit and for your glory. We lift up this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. Thank you, David. Um, please stand. Thought you guys knew that already. <laughs> uh, the, our closing song will be about God's grace. And isn't it just marvelous that we bring worship to Him today? And when we bring it in Jesus' name, He accepts it. Not because we are worthy, but because we, we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ.
Thank you so much, uh, April and Daniel, for leading us beautifully today in great songs. So uh, you may be seated. Something that is unique uh, to living in Whistler is uh, people come and go. Uh, there's a pretty good turnover of people because it's such a unique place. So today, we are saying goodbye to Zane. And Zane, I'm going to invite you up. Yeah, she doesn't know that we're going to do this. <laughs> Unless somebody leaked it, but anyway. Uh, so we're saying goodbye to Zane, and Zane is going back to Latvia. Um, Zane has been in Canada for a year. And uh, didn't you, did you join us in, like, November? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'd just like to pray for you. And you have really blessed us by being here. Um, Zane has really been all in in this church community. She's become part of the family. She's been part of women's Bible study, uh, tons of recreational things going on. Um, uh, I probably don't even know half of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, we just... We've really been blessed getting to know you and having you here. So we want to just pray for you. And uh, is there anything you want to say to us? Okay. <laughs> uh, so if you would like to help uh, send Zane, we invite you up to come on up. And are you, are you okay if we lay hands on you? Okay. <laughs> So if you would like to pray, you can use the microphone from Steve, and uh, I'll lead out, and Steve will close. God, we just thank you and praise you for our sister in Christ, uh, Zane. We thank you for just the, the incredible way that you just draw people here to Whistler, um, your beauty, beauty and your majesty are here in such plentiful and abundant ways. And so we thank you that people are drawn here and we get to be benefactors of meeting wonderful people that come um, through this place. Uh, we just uh, want to leave this scripture with, with Zane as she travels back to Latvia, a place that is um, situationally... Uh, located in um, certainly a more dangerous place. And um, we just pray these words uh, that God spoke to your servant Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. will be with her and we trust that they will be we uh, we just hand her over to you and your sovereign grace thank you father amen amen so All right, uh, well, we've come to the end of the service. Uh, uh, just a quick plea before, we, before I read the benediction. Um, there will be uh, coffee and tea served in the fellowship hall, so please join us for uh, coffee and conversation. And our benediction today is from Jude uh, chapter 2, verses... Oh, what chapter is it from? Oh, yeah, that's right, there's only one chapter in Jude. <laughs> Uh, verses 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Go with grace. <laughs>